Check, check, check. Hello, everybody awake? It looks like it. We'll see if we can wake you up a little bit more. Hi, I'm Nina Ritchie. I'm a folk singer and songwriter from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm here for the Humanities Project in your great town here. It's a thrill to be here in this western town. Uh, I haven't been out west very much, but I'm starting to do a little more traveling. Uh, my presentation is Gateway to Country Music. How many of you like country music? Anybody? Yeah, sort of? Okay. All right. Well, if it's new to you in some way, then you're going to be learning a little bit about the roots of it. It's not going to sound like what you hear on the radio today. I'm from Nashville, so I, I know the music, that kind of music, but I come from a different background. I come from folk music, so... If you've ever learned about Woody Guthrie, and uh, he was from Tulsa, there's a museum out there that you can go and tour. That is more the kind of country music that I'm familiar with. Uh, so this gateway to country music can be interpreted in a lot of ways. Um, my gateway into country music was actually Bruce Springsteen. Anybody know of Bruce Springsteen out there? Yeah? All right. You must be a music fan over there. And, uh, and I grew up around the country music, but not this kind. I'm going to teach you some about the roots of country music, um, the Carter family, Jimmy Rogers, and some folks that you may not have heard of but are the basis of the music that you hear today. All right, I'm going to be toggling between this a little bit. In Nashville, we have a place called Carter Vintage Guitars, and you can go and find guitars from all different eras, the early 20s, the actually early 1900s, uh, and uh, this is a lady named Mother Maybell Carter. I'm going to start off with a song. It's called Wildwood Flower. It comes from England. It traveled over to the United States, and uh, a lot of people start out playing guitar by this song, learning this song.
Thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. Okay. Well, why I am interested in this topic is because I live in Nashville and I uh, also had the opportunity to perform with someone who uh, is back from the 60s, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Uh, one of the members has moved to Nashville and I got to perform with him and I was representing the lady up there, Mother Maybell Carter, and sang a few songs with him at the Franklin Theater earlier this year. And there he is, John McEwen. And he has written a book about uh, a, an album that came out in the 1970s called Will the Circle Be Unbroken? I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions that we're going to answer throughout this presentation. The first one is, where did country music originate? If you were to guess where the, the uh, country music city that we have in the U.S. is, where would that be? Can you think of country music? What city would that come from? Anybody? Well, it's where I'm from. It's from Nashville. Most people would say that. But I recently uh, went to a museum. It's on the corner of, of uh, Tennessee and Western Virginia. It's called Bristol. Just this little bitty town, but that's where a lot of the country music came from, Western Virginia and Tennessee. We get it from a lot of different places, but I'll tell you why I say it's the birthplace of country music. Uh, and the next question is, how did country music become popular? I'm going to answer that in a, the next few slides. We're going to start out back in 1865 with the end of the American Civil War. Uh, now, the South is a, an entity unto its own, and the, and the Civil War kind of solidified that. The, the culture kind of just stayed in one region of the country, and it kind of percolated there until people discovered it. Uh, during the early 20s and started actually studying it. Now, this study is going to be primarily on this section of America called Appalachia. There is a mountain range that runs from Newfoundland and Canada all the way down to central Alabama and uh, eastern Mississippi. And this is where a lot of the music came from. So later I'm going to be singing a song that has a yodel in it. And a lot of uh, people from Germany's, the the Swiss regions of Europe immigrated to America and they brought some of their culture with them and that influences the, the uh, country music. All right, and this is what the, the, region, the uh, mountain range looks like. It goes for many, many miles and I've had occasion to travel some of those miles and it's, it takes you a whole lot longer. Mountain miles are, are a lot longer. Y'all have the Ozarks out here and you have a lot of music in the Ozarks as well. Now, events that led to the popularization of country music was the Industrial Revolution. So, if you've heard of Eli Whitney, who revolu revolutionized the cotton industry with his cotton gin, that was kind of the beginning of many different inventions that were coming out. Um, the light bulb you've obviously heard of from Thomas Edison. Uh, I, I'm going to go through these briefly. 1877, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. Have you ever used a turntable before? I know LPs are becoming very popular again. And it's very much the same process as it was back then, only they had a big cone, and I'll show you what a gramophone looks like. Uh, but that changed things forever for music, because mostly people were only going to live shows. Okay, 1879, the 78 RPM record was invented. 1881, Alexander Graham Bell invented the gramophone, and then they, they came out with a disc phonograph, so it was getting uh, easier to get these recording devices that produce sound. Okay, the, the Industrial Revolution also um, produced the Victor Talking Machine. Uh, the Victor Talking Machine Company came out with their own Victrola, which is a device that people could actually have in their homes, and they would be able to play records for themselves. Uh, when they just started making these recording devices, they actually could not listen back. They would only record, and people could hear on the other side like a microphone, but they couldn't play it back, so nobody could keep the music that they liked. Um, so Victor Talking Machine Company became quite interested in country music. They found out that it sold very well. And three <coughs> record labels cropped up at that time. There was 
Columbia Records, Victor, and OK. And all of them had what we call hillbilly music or down-home music, which eventually was called country music. Hillbillies didn't really want to be called that because it had a negative connotation. All right. So there you go. Hillbilly music or down-home music. Now this was is a picture of Eck Robertson. He was one of the first country performers to ever be recorded. He was recorded in 1922 by Victor Records. And uh, he came from Texas, and before he started recording, he was in what's called medicine shows. People would travel around with these shows, and uh, the, their main purpose was to sell um, cure-all um, tonics and things like that, but they would have music, and so the musicians found that they could make a living off of these medicine shows. So Eck Robertson was a fiddler. Uh, his first recordings, he had four recordings and he was just playing fiddle on them. Now, emancipation brought a lot of good things. Um, that we were able to be introduced to blues music and OK Records uh, allowed black musicians to be able to record and in that time came people like Ma Rainey, she was one of the first very um, popular blues musicians. She had a song called Crazy Blues, but I think even more popular than her was Bessie Smith. And this comes from a museum in, Ch uh, museum in Chattanooga. I am living there currently, and so I'm getting to learn some of her history. She was known as the Empress of the Blues, and she was the highest paid black performer of her time. An incredible talent, and she did all kinds of different music. Most of the what we would call blues music was tinged with jazz and ragtime music, and I will be able to segue this into country. Um, I'll sing just a little bit of one of her songs, and I'll just do it off cappella. I hate to see the evening sun go down. I hate to see the evening sun go down Cause my baby He's gone and left this town Feeling tomorrow Like I feel today Feeling tomorrow Like I feel today Gonna pack my bags up and make my get away. St. Louis woman with her diamond rings pulls my man around by her apron strings. If it weren't for powder and for store my hair. Uh, was a one of the first songs to ever be recorded with film. So back in the early 1920s, it was released, and it was just Bessie Smith, and uh, she had a whole choir behind her. It was completely amazing. And uh, W.C. Handy is the father of the blues, and he wrote that song. Do you have a question? That's all I have. Okay. I was going to ask uh, the last name of that song. The name of the song, St. Louis Blues. Definitely look up. It's like the first music video. There was no MTV back then, but it was. it is very cool to look up that song. All right. Okay, so here's where we start to talk about country music. Um, as I was mentioning, mentioning ragtime music, um, when you hear me go like this, the basis for that kind of strum and uh, the jingle jangle sound is ragtime music. Um, it comes out of New York and a lot of the, um, the early American singers kind of started to blend jazz into the American songs. So uh, songs like Alexander's Ragtime Band, that's another one you can find from Bessie Smith, Alexander's Ragtime Band. And that sound actually is kind of the basis for country music. 
Um, I'll sing a song from Jimmy Rogers that will kind of prove the point there. All right. He was discovered in what we call the Bristol Sessions, and they happened in 1927 in Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, the Victor Talking Machine Company decided that it was going to start to cash in on these hillbillies, as they called them, and they sent a man named Ralph Peer, a producer, down to the South just to see what would crop up if there was any talent in the South that he could record and start selling those um, LPs, I guess you could call them. And uh, he brought a whole team of um, engineers with him, and they recorded in a hat store. And they just put the call out, and everybody in the mountains said, okay, I want to be recorded. I've got a band. Let's, let's do this. And uh, so some of the stars of this recording session were Jimmy Rogers, the Carters, and the Stonemans. All right, I'm going to sing this song. It's called Blue Yodel Number no. 1, T for Texas, and I'll just do a bit of it. stranger to the blues. Uh, he's known as the singing brakeman, and that's what he did back in the day. Is uh, his, One of his first jobs was as a brakeman on a train. And uh, let's see if I can bring another one of those Carter family songs up. Let me scoot down a little bit. Uh, this is the Museum for the Birthplace of Country Music. If you're ever in Tennessee, this is a great destination to visit. It has a whole lot of history and some of the stuff I'm sharing with you. Today, and this is Ralph Peer. He's the one who was producing these Bristol sessions. He was pretty convinced that he was the only one who knew how to record hillbillies, so uh, he's credited for discovering all those acts. All right. Let's skip a little bit ahead. Okay, here are the stars. All right, I'm going to sing a song. It's called um, You've Been a Friend to Me, and it's from the Carter family. It was recorded a little bit later after the Bristol Sessions. But you'll notice it's got a really nasally sound, and that comes from Appalachia. All, a lot of the music back then was a little bit hard to listen to. All right, here it goes.
me. Well, as you'll notice, there's a lot of trouble in that song. They're clinging to the things that are good in their lives and the people who uh, made them strong. And in uh, Appalachia, there was there's a lot of poverty even to this day, and coal, coal mining is the primary source of income. And uh, that brings me to another song. Um, I think I'm gonna make it this way. All right, yeah, it's lined up that way. Tennessee Ernie Ford was actually from Bristol. And as I was mentioning early, earlier, Nashville uh, is the Music City USA, and it's really known for country music, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in coming slides, but uh, Ernie Ford actually left Bristol because there was no music industry there. There was the, the recordings that were made there. So he came to Nashville because they had the Grand Ole Opry. So I'm gonna sing a bit of his song. It's called 16 Tons. And um, the funny thing about those coal mines is they have an allure to them because you can make an income and you can um, spend your life there and, um, and just provide for your family, but um, they are mysterious and there's lots of songs about them. And this one, 16 Tons, is, a, is from that kind of Tennessee, Virginia coal mining area. the development of Nashville. So with all of the um, new technology that was coming about during the Industrial Revolution, we got radio in Nashville. And the uh, one radio show that we had that was very, very popular was uh, WSM Radio, and they presented the Grand Ole Opry. How many of y'all have heard of the Grand Ole Opry? Yeah? Okay. Well, it still goes on today, and you can still uh, go to shows at the Opry. Some of them are a little bit maybe not as country anymore. Uh, but it started out in the Ryman Auditorium, which was a church um, that was started to unify the city and um, bring the gospel to um, all the people who lived in Nashville. And then as things started to change, they decided that they would bring a wholesome show that would bring country music to the world. And so it did. Now, I'm going to be singing a song called Will the Circle Be Unbroken. How many of y'all have heard that song before? Anybody? All right. It's one that uh, people in the South like to sing together. And uh, after you hear the chorus one time, I think you'll be able to sing along with me. And as I was mentioning, um, the Appalachians, a, a lot of their con the content of their songs is about toil and struggle. And um, their music was a way of kind of uh, just like we do today, when we have t struggles and, and uh, we sing about them, but it somehow kind of lessens the load. And that is definitely how it was for the Appalachian people. And this is a Carter family song. It actually comes from England and had some different words to it. Okay, let me try to cue this one up.
country music and there is a circle in there that if you stand in it you can hear yourself sing and you sound like an angel I promise you it doesn't matter if you can sing or not it sounds very good in that circle all right this is what the Ryman auditorium looked like it uh, opened in the early 20s, and it was a labor of love. There was a man named Tom Ryman who had attended a gospel series, and it was uh, specifically um, for uh, targeting drunkenness. We had a problem with drunkenness in Nashville. I'd say we still have one, probably. Broadway is the biggest drunkenest place you've ever been. But, uh, but now this is uh, modern-day times. This is what the Ryman looks like. And... We still have music there today. Now, this is the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. I was mentioning them at the beginning, and uh, the man that I played with, he's the one with the banjo. He's uh, one, two, three, number four there. That's John McEwen. And uh, these guys were from California, and they were having some hits in rock and roll, and they were kind of country tinged. But the funny thing about it was, is when rock and roll came in in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, it pretty much wiped out some of the original country music, and a lot of those stars were kind of, you know, they weren't as popular as they were. But these guys, that's who they looked up to. They had records of theirs that the parents would play, and, and they just kind of worshipped these country stars, and they wanted to come back to Nashville and meet some of those people. So if you've ever watched a show called The Beverly Hillbillies, there was a man named Earl Scruggs who played the banjo, and he was sort of the in for them. Uh, he brought them to the stars, and uh, they wanted to record with them. And that was the whole, the whole process there. Hold on just a second. So on the left is Merle Travis, and the uh, right is Jimmy Martin. He was more of a bluegrass singer. There's Earl Scruggs on the left and Mother Maybelle Carter. These were some people that were just still in Nashville. They had come there for the music business. And, uh, and then, you know, Dead new times came through and they become, became less popular. So um, they wanted to bring them out of obscurity. So they set up a recording session and they brought people like Roy Acuff as well. Um, and those those people were kind of skeptical of them because obviously they were some they were hippies basically from California and nobody knew if they could play their music and honor it uh, correctly. Um, but they eventually realized that those guys were just there to 
kind of facilitate bringing them back out into the public and repopularizing the music. So they recorded an album called Will the Circle Be Unbroken, and that was the final song on the album. And um, the, it was so historically significant that they actually put it in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, that's what the Country Music Hall of Fame looks like from the outside. You can visit any old day. And this is me with John McEwen and the rest of his circle band. And there is the album cover. And this is at the end of my presentation. But I'm going to uh, end off on a song that I wrote. I'm country influenced, but I'm a little bit more towards the folk music. So uh, this is a song called All the Crown Jewels. I wrote about my Aunt Margaret, who has a fabulous jewelry collection she wanted to show me. I hope you like it, and I hope you've learned something. your phones out and scan that QR code. I know you know how to do it. I'm on YouTube. I'm also on Instagram and those places. All the crown jewels, all the crown jewels, Margaret said she showed me all the crown jewels in my glass. Magnify the Lord, and I can't wait till I get the glitter in my eyes, glitter in my eyes, glitter in my eyes.